Looking at the book of Mark, uh, we're in chapter 6 of the book of Mark, and um, I'm going to be talking about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, and, and I'm going to be talking about feeding the spiritual hungry this morning. And there's certain miracles that uh, Jesus performed that make, I, I mean, all of them do, but some stand out in making profound statements on the nature of God and, and the way that he interacts with people. And, and today we're going to explore one of these miracles. Now, when Jesus began his ministry, he called 12 men to follow him, specifically, to start. And the Lord poured into these men more than anyone of his other disciples. And they became known as the 12 apostles, eventually. And the dictionary defines apostle as being one who is called out or an emissary. Now, the 12 apostles were authorized agents. Uh, they were representatives of Jesus. And we see in Mark chapter 6 that um, the 12 had been sent out by Jesus into the surrounding countryside two by two where they brought a message of repentance and they healed sick people and they, 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 ex they cast out demons from those who were possessed and tormented by the enemy of our souls. Now this is recorded in Mark 6, 7 to 13 and not everyone that they went to received their message with joy. As a matter of fact, some of the towns they went to didn't accept their message and they shook the dust from their feet. But for those who accepted them and the message they delivered, brought, God brought success accompanied by signs and wonders in this case. And the apostles, they returned to Jesus after going out into the countryside. They returned to Jesus to report back to him on what had been accomplished on this mission that they had gone on. And, and, and people had taken notice of what was happening. They were getting excited with what God was doing. Particularly, I think their attention was drawn to miraculous signs and wonders that were being performed. And this is where we're going to pick up on the story. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, verse 30, starting with verse 30, where we're going to read about the next big event that takes place in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So reading from Mark chapter 6, starting with verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. And we're told here that the crowds were unbelievable. So many people were coming and going from Jesus' presence and his apostles that they weren't even getting the chance to eat. They were just so crowded and inundated by these hungry people who were looking for something more in their lives. And uh, sometimes, with all the needs that are present in the world, when God, God is moving and, and, and people are seeing his reality at work, those who work in ministering to people's needs, like the apostles and like Jesus, experience long hours meeting those needs. And when word gets out and spiritually hungry people come, there are days where, and nights where there's much to do and there's much going on. And a person ministering to the needs of others can only put in so many hours without getting physically weary from serving. There's something about pouring yourself out that drains you of your physical energy. Now, the wonderful thing about all this is, you know, maybe you've experienced this as well, where you, you pour yourself out to the service of the Lord, you know, in a ministry in the church, and sometimes you, you feel like it's, you feel weary because 
sometimes the, uh, the crowds of people can press in on you and the demands can be extremely, um, extremely tasking. But Jesus is familiar with our physical constraints. He is. And uh, himself, taking on the form of a man, being born of the Virgin Mary, came as a human being, fully God, but fully man as well. He understood the constraints of living in this physical realm and living with a physical body. And upon recognition that both he and his apostles were feeling excessively weary from the pressures, the relentless pressures of ministering to these crowds of people with needs, he called out to his apostles and he asked them to take a break. They cast out from the shore in the boat that they had and to travel to a solitary place where they could get some well-deserved and well-needed rest. Apostles had just come back from this major campaign of ministering in the area, so they were tired. We continue reading in verse 33. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw such a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. People who were hungry for what Jesus was teaching and what he was doing. They didn't realize how tired the apostles and and the Lord were in their physical bodies. They didn't realize that. All they knew was that something was happening here that was miraculous. And when they saw them cast out from shore, they were alarmed at their departure and so that they wouldn't lose touch with the Lord, they ran around the shoreline. You can picture them looking at the boat, you know, leaving the shore of the Sea of Galilee out into the, into the deep water and, and they're going across. And, and, you know, the Sea of Galilee, for those of you who don't know it, is not such a large body of water that you can't see uh, a great distance out into the, into the lake. It's actually a fresh water lake on the top and there's salt water underneath but the sea of galilee you can see so they saw jesus and his disciples heading out and, and they did, the, the word got around jesus and his disciples they're going across the lake we got to meet them on the other side so they ran around the shoreline and followed the boat to where jesus and his apostles they landed in this solitary place when they landed there Instead of being a solitary place of quiet, the crowds met them. And Jesus looked at these people and he realized that they had gone out of their way to come and see him. Now, I suppose if I were one of them, or maybe you were one of those apostles, and this happened to me, um, I'd probably be thinking to myself, "Hmm, don't you know I've been through... So much pouring of myself out day and night. I'm tired. I need to catch a break, people. It's not like I don't want to help you or anything, but I just want to get some rest. I'm so weary right now. And and there's nothing wrong with going to a place of rest. But the master, who felt exactly the same way as his disciples... Although no doubt he was weary himself, he, he looked at the large crowd that had gathered and, and he could see that they were hungry for some truth. They were hungry to see God move. Now, not all of them had a hunger for truth. Some of them were just there because it was the latest thing and Jesus was doing miracles and they wanted to be part of it. But Jesus, despite his weariness, looked out with compassion upon those people. Like, These people need truth. So he began to teach them many things. Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. You know, everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And he began to preach the truth. And what was Jesus modeling in this case? Those apostles were dead, beat, tired, and so was the Lord. But Jesus modeled the apostles to the apostles his sacrificial love. 
Now, I'm not, I don't think he was advocating workaholicism. He wasn't doing that. There were times when Jesus went off on his own to pray and, and took a break and a rest. But there's sometimes when in, our, in the routine that God has placed us in where someone will come to our door and knock and say, I need help. My friends, that's not the time to say, listen, I'm sorry. I'm too tired to deal with you today. See, Jesus modeled this sacrificial love. A former Bible college professor of mine recently posted this meme on Facebook, which said, one of the most important keys to success is having the discipline to do what we know, what we should do, even when we don't feel like doing it. I'm sure Jesus was weary. Even though Jesus he was weary and tired, he exemplified what it means to do what's right sacrificially because of love for other people. He put, his, he put the needs of others ahead of his own. And um, being a thoroughly other-centered person, Jesus stepped out and he began to do the work that the Father had called him to in this circumstance. And what followed, my friends, what followed was simply glorious. And reading from verse five, 35 of our text, we're told, by this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. And you can almost hear them hoping <laughs> that there would be a bit of a break, right? Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Well, when you carefully consider the conundrum that was before them, both Jesus and his apostles, they saw exactly the same need amongst these people, amongst the throngs of people. And the disciples' solution was to get rid of the need by getting rid of the needy people. But the Lord Jesus had to teach his young apprentices something about the power of God and his sustaining work, even when we come to the end of ourselves. The Lord Jesus said in 37, he answered, you give them something to eat. Wow, they weren't expecting that now. You give them something to eat. Hmm. They're looking out at this crowd of people. They said, damn, that would take more than a half year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it them to eat? You can imagine this look of bewilderment on the apostles' faces and the other disciples that were with them. Jesus, you can't be serious. Like, this is a... A very large crowd. I mean, it's not just like 10 or 20 people here. I, I think it's probably likely that none of them had ever seen a crowd this large gathering in one place before. Now, we don't know all the emotions that each of the apostles had. They likely had a mixed bag of emotions. Some possibly had a little bit of anger. I don't know. Maybe cynical. We're just blown away by this request. I mean, we don't know. But after working so hard for the kingdom of God, the whole episode that they were seeing was taking away the peace and quiet that they were looking forward to. They were looking forward to spending alone time with Jesus, quiet time with Jesus. And here's all these people. There's more than 5,000 men. We don't know exactly the number of all the people there because it says 5,000 men in number for just one simple meal. It would cost half a year's wages. For a working man, it, and it would be simpler just to send them away, and that way they could kind of get the break they needed, and then they could pick up with it later. I don't even think at this time they considered the fact that Jesus might just provide food for this crowd with a miracle. Now, how many times when you and I enter an impossible scenario that we see in our lives come across our paths and and it looks just like we can't possibly meet the need here. We can't possibly go further because we're spent. How many times has that happened in our lives if you've been a believer for any, any number of years? If 
we're honest with ourselves, I think we can say without a hesitation or reservation that we likely, if we were in that scenario that day, would be thinking very similarly to the apostles. My friends, this is the truth. Our God in heaven, our heavenly Father, has resources that we know nothing about. And what Jesus was about to show these people is that God is fully aware of the need present that is amongst the people. God is fully aware of the need that is present in your circumstances with the people that are around you in your life too. And he's just as aware of your need. And he was just aware of the need that was present in this place as he was when he provided manna for the children of Israel when they were wandering through the desert. He was going to provide a feast for them. What Jesus was presenting to them was extravagant. But in the, inter- the interesting part of all this is that Jesus, he didn't just want to intervene here on his own. He wanted, he wanted to teach his apostles and disciples. He wanted to teach them a lesson about who he is. He wanted them to come along for the ride. So, in verse 38 we read, How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. So you feed them. Bring me what you have, is what he's saying. When they found out, they said five and two fish. And at this point, the disciples must have suspected that something was up. Don't you think? He asked them to go bring what they have. Now, I I think they were suspecting something's up here. Now, Jesus didn't tell them to go into Capernaum to order deluxe pizza for 5,000 plus people. He didn't do that. If there was pizza at that time, I don't think there was, but... He asked them to bring him what they had. What was in their possession? What was amongst them? And the apostles could only come up with five loaves of bread and two fish. And to meet such a vast need of so many people, the apostles had to come to the point where they recognized that the need far outweighed their ability to feed such a large group of people. And they had to depend upon God and they had to put their trust in the Master. God's like this. When we look at the spiritual needs of those he places all around us and tells us to bring what we have to the table, bring it to him, we're much like those apostles who needed to learn something about God's ability to meet needs. They didn't have the provisions. Sometimes you are in a scenario in your life, in your family, in your church, your relationships, where it seems to be an impossibility. There's just too many obstacles in the way to be able to share effectively the Lord. You've been doing it for years. It just seems like an insurmountable thing. But God says otherwise because God is the Lord of all creation. And there is absolutely nothing that is impossible for him. Absolutely nothing. There is no circumstance in your life that God does not see and God is not able to meet you where you are and meet and address the need that you face. They didn't have the provisions, but the storehouses of the Lord God Jehovah, creator of the heavens and the earth, had all that they needed. So what the disciples brought to Jesus was blessed by God. These disciples were asked to participate with him by organizing the people into groups of hundreds and fifties. And the Lord Jesus blessed the food. And then he commanded his disciples to distribute it. 39 says, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. 
Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to his disciples to distribute among the people. And he also divided the two fish amongst them. All. When Jesus blesses the gifts that we present to him for the benefit of others, all he asks is that we bring him what we have. And we can get overwhelmed. I don't have a lot to offer. Neither do you. Can we do the work of God? Have you tried to do the work of God in your own strength? Have you tried to minister in circumstances and tried to convince people to become Christians in your family or in your, your workplaces and all that? You've tried in your own, have you tried that before in your own strength? I have. And I've fallen flat on my face. I, th- I think there's something here. We need to realize as the disciples of Christ how little it is that we really have to offer. But how great our God is and how grateful we can be that he asks us to participate with him in the distribution of life-giving things. In ourselves, look at the scenario here. They couldn't even put a dent in what was there for need. This is one meal. They couldn't put a dent in that one meal even, let alone feed, give provisions to these people to keep them going for a length of time. But here we see it. The miracle took place. Jesus blessed it, and he asked his disciples to break it and to pass it out. And what does it say in verse 42? They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. The 12 baskets of leftovers represented God's provision for the whole nation of God's chosen people. All 12 tribes represented in the overflow and the abundance. God is able to satisfy the hunger of all of his people, the spiritual hunger of all his people. And what's really interesting in this story that followed, you can imagine the stir that would have caused this this group of people to get all worked up and excited with what they were seeing. Can you imagine you're there? And as the, as the bread goes out, they look and, oh, hey, I just broke a piece of that off. And it, it grew, it's, boom, they, they couldn't understand. It was a miracle. The bread and fish came out of thin air as the disciples distributed what Jesus had blessed and In the follow-up, you see, what happened after this, I'm going to jump into John for just a bit. See, after this occurred, they were all just amazed. Wow! I'm sure they were talking amongst each other. Wow, look at what's happened here. Look Look at this miracle. And then Jesus and his disciples, after this miracle, they went back out in the boat, took off out in the lake. Hey, where are you guys going? Hey, Jesus and his disciples are going there. Let's follow them. So they ran around the lake again. This crowd was relentless. They were so excited to see this miracle. When they found him on the other side, it says in John chapter 6, verse 25. John chapter 6, if you just flip there. This is kind of a follow-up and a tie-in to what we're talking about here. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi... When did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So I'm sure all these people, these 10,000 people or 5,000 men and however many children and women that were there, they're like, Wow, is this the beginning of the Messiah's reign? He's going to raise us up as an army and he's going to feed us just like the children of Israel in the desert. We're going to get fed by the manna. And, you know, he's going to rise up as the Messiah, be this great military leader and go and kick butt on those oppressive Romans. Oh, I'm in on this. Give me some more bread, Jesus. We like the bread. And we're with you on that one. And then Jesus says that, what I just read. Then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And, and Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he sent. Okay, 
Yeah, we're good with that so far. So they asked him, what sign will you give then that we may see it and believe you? Can, can you believe that? He just made bread and fish come out of thin air and fed 10,000 or whatever many thousand people. And here they are asking, what sign will you give to us that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So see that connection? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Always. We want the manna. Come on. Bring on the manna. We're with you. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I have told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Wow. This is Jesus revealing His true purpose in performing this great miracle. Jesus, as the Savior of the world, would give Himself to be the bread of life for a starving world on that old rugged cross. They would sing Hosanna, glory to the name of the Lord as he came into Jerusalem and they'd lay palm branches down before him and then Jesus, rather than becoming what they thought he should be, gave his life on Calvary so that others might have eternal life. You see, Jesus was trying to explain to them that he was the bread that they needed for spiritual life, that the bread was in him. Yes, it was distributed through his servants, as it is today, through you and through me. We break the bread and pass it on. We're satisfied by it, but we share it with others around us. There's more than enough for the grace of God to be distributed from Jesus to satisfy everyone's spiritual hunger. Twelve basketfuls represents the overflow, the fullness, the full number of God's children and more. As the disciples of Christ, we can learn. We should never doubt God's supply of our needs. He will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. The Lord can supply what is needed under any circumstance, and we don't have to worry about physical food because God's going to supply our needs. But more importantly, we don't have to worry, and this is where this drives home. This is a spiritual lesson. We don't have to worry about spiritual food because God will supply the need we have for spiritual life, for eternal life that does not end in the brokenness that we see in the physical realm in our bodies, in the physical time that we spend here. As the Lord's servant, just as in the day, uh, servants today, just as in the day of this miracle, we recognize there's hungry people around, spiritually hungry. And the gospel goes forward and people hear the gospel and they have the opportunity to respond. They're hungry, and some of them don't even know what they're hungry for. But they sometimes, when we go out and we share, people get it wrong. They're looking at Jesus as being the satisfier of their temporal needs. That, oh, if I accept Jesus, my life here on the earth is just going to go, whoo-hoo. I'm going to be healthy. It's going to bring health to my physical body. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to have all this extra cash that uh, will help me live in comfort. And um, it comes from God. Oh, yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have this for me right here and right now. And what is Christ teaching? He said, now, if you 
want to see the kingdom of God flourishing, you've got to be willing to give yourself away in imitation of me. Jesus gave himself as the bread of life to, to save that which was lost. His purpose was not temporal like these people wanted. They wanted this temporal relief in their circumstance. Jesus wasn't about that. He's looking at eternal life. You know, your little life here on the earth, even if you're aged, it's just like a little pinprick on a dot that goes on, a line that goes on forever in both directions. Eternal life, God came to seek and save that which is lost. He came with an eternal perspective. Everything that happens in the present circumstances of our life has an eternal purpose. We must believe that Jesus Christ has the whole world in his hands. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. There is no end to his kingdom. His kingdom endures forever. He is Lord over all, including the things that we have on the plate before us right now in the physical circumstance. And God wants us to come to the point where we trust him with everything. And he's calling us to that. Now, when Jesus taught this, when he taught this, it would be good to say that a lot of these people understood. When he started to say that he's the bread of life and they need to feast on him, they didn't get it. They're, like, they're, they're thinking on this physical plane. They didn't understand that he was the sacrificial lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. He was the Passover lamb. God in the flesh come down because of his great love for humanity, not wanting to see them perish in their sins. He came down, became a man, and walked among them to show them what God is like with skin on and to show them the way to life so that when they would believe in him, the sacrificial offering of Jesus, the shed blood on the cross that would be offered for them, the broken body that would be offered for them would reconcile them to their creator. Brokenness because of sin. Jesus was showing them that he is the bread of life. He is the source of all spiritual life. He's the beginning and the end and everything in between. And they could trust him with their lives. When he said this, it was infuriating because in John 6, 41 and 42, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that come down from heaven. They said, they go back to this. Remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago? If you're not here a couple weeks ago, we talked about this. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say that I came down from heaven? You see, they didn't see they just assumed what they thought Jesus was. Jesus was some kind of magic genie that was just going to bring them everything they wanted in this world. They didn't want to accept the fact that he came from heaven. They saw him grow up in Nazareth and the word got around. But they didn't know what happened in Bethlehem or they didn't believe it if they'd heard it. They didn't know Jesus wasn't actually born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem and he was born from his mother, but he wasn't the biological son of his father. Joseph, Joseph was his adopted father. His father was father in heaven, born of a virgin, the spotless lamb of God. They didn't see. They didn't recognize him. And Jesus clarified it. He said in John 6, 43 to 51, stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. Not only, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am. Notice how he says, I am. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And Jesus lays it out. You know what happened? That day, despite this great miracle that occurred, 
the day before, that day, many, many, many of the people that were following, looking at Jesus, asking him to meet their needs, fell away, and they stopped following the Lord of glory. My friends, don't be discouraged when people reject what you put before them. When you bring them the bread and they, they take it and they, they're thinking about it and it sinks into them, don't be surprised if when they hear the gospel in its entirety that they push away and say, no, we're looking for a different kind of Savior. We're not looking for the Savior that Jesus, you say that you are. The gate is narrow. Wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many there are that follow it. Narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few there are that find it. Jesus laid out the truth. But what was said in John 1, 10 and 12 was true on this day, and it's still true today. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, to them who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And that is the truth that sets people free. And when Jesus saw all these people walking away, after all that he had done, even in that circumstance, when he saw them walking away, in John 6, 67 and 69, he says to his core disciples, you do not want to leave me too, do you? And Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen. See, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, the daughters of God. God's called you. It's not going to be always easy. God's not always going to drop things into your plate that are painless. Sometimes you'll have to bear a cross. Sometimes you'll have to bear scorn and rejection from those who will not believe. But know that the Lord is with you. Jesus has the words of eternal life. He's called you. If you're here this morning and you have never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, today can be the first day. There's eternal life in him. If you're here and you're discouraged because things just aren't going well, you're tired, You've just been spurned even. After God's done so many great things in your life, you present the gospel and they turn away and they go, what is that? That's not what we want. Never give up. See, Jesus didn't give up here. Jesus continued his ministry and he, he took the cross for you and for me. He died so that we could have life. And to us, this is the, enc the encouragement that if he was raised from the dead, we too will be raised on the final day. We too will inherit the life that Jesus represents. We don't have to be afraid and we don't have to worry and we don't have to get twisted out of shape when it doesn't work all that well out for us here in the earth. Jesus has those words of eternal life. And he's calling you to follow him, to be an imitator of him, to pick up your cross daily and follow him. That means dying to self and living for the gospel of Christ. Amen. Would you bow with us in prayer?